Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. It's uh, Roxanne Durhodge. Thanks again for tuning in this week. Uh, this week I have a colleague that I've known, Kristen, now for about, goodness, over 15 years, I guess, was how long we worked together. Uh, so Kristen, Kristen, welcome uh, to uh, Authentic Living with Roxanne. Hi, Roxanne. Wonderful to be here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kristen. And uh, Kristen and I uh, work together in corporate uh, health and wellness consulting um, at uh, one of the biggest uh, health and wellness firms now, I would say, in North America. So for the last uh, 10 years, Kristen has consulted with hundreds of organizations across various industries, helping create positive and productive uh, workplaces. Uh, she has had specialties in talent management, leadership development, organizational wellness, team effectiveness, and performance management. Uh, you started your coaching practice back in two, 2017, which I've been privileged to watch her uh, rise and uh, go out on her own. And her mission in the workplace is to help leaders develop greater awareness and emotional intelligence and lead with courage, which I know is a big thing uh, for leaders to have, and reach their full potential and bring out the best in their people. You also work with individuals. Kristen's a graduate of McMaster University. She has had um, some of the best coaching designations. She's done the Coacher Training Institute, CTI, and the C CPCC designation, which is a Certified Professional Coactive Coach, which I'm interested in hearing you talking a little bit about that. So Kristen, is there anything that you'd like the listeners to know that I've missed here um, that speaks to kind of what you're doing out there in the, in the workplace? Yeah, no, I think you really covered it. I think the only thing I didn't mention there in the bio is I also do a lot of speaking on these topics. So working one-on-one -on -one with the coaching practice and then speaking with teams and with organizations and at conferences around these different subjects. Awesome. So tell me, I mean, obviously, uh, going back, like was it, I think it was 15 years ago, that's when uh, at that point, uh, we worked uh, in, in health and wellness consulting. So tell me kind of your path and what you've done and what you've taken out of that um, kind of space into your own coaching and know, because you work with individuals and organizations, what's the main kind of things that you focus on when you work with either individuals or, or uh, organizations? Yeah, so when we were working together, um, I was so passionate about that work with the from the health and wellness perspective, because um, it does have such a, a big impact on the organization from a bottom line perspective, right? If you're creating an environment where people can bring their best selves to work, where they're feeling healthy, where they're feeling engaged, where they're feeling happy. And as I started to do the work at Chappelle FGI and then moved into my work at the McQuaig Institute um, and doing the HR consulting, a lot of times organizations would be focused on talent management and getting top talent and getting high potentials, um, which is wonderful. Of course, those are the people you want to work with your organ in your organization. Um, high potentials, high performers, most of them, 80% of them are passive candidates. So they're already working. They don't need to leave where they are to come to your organization. Um, if they're going to leave, there's got to be a really good reason to leave and come to your place. And that's, um, they're looking for an organization that's going to have a positive culture, where there's going to be meaning in their work, where they can innovate, where they can be creative, where they can use all of their talents. So what I started to notice is, um, yes, this emphasis on getting the right people, but in order to have the right people, there needs to be more of an emphasis on what kind of culture are you trying to create in, a, in an authentic way, not who you say you are, um, but who you really are in terms of living and breathing those values. And the other place is really helping leaders because when you have those individuals come and work for you, they need to be supported by leaders who are going to help unleash 
all of their potential. Um, so from my perspective, uh, I love also helping leaders to get more attuned with who they are, go on their own journey of self-awareness, because the more they, mo they know themselves, the more they can help the people around them, bring the best out of those individuals, and create really positive work environments where the team, there's this beautiful team cohesion, and they're all working um, together with these common goals. So obviously there's core uh, elements that makes a, an authentic leader. And um, when you go into organizations that are trying to attract, let's say, you know, you know top talent is hard to, to um, harness, right? Like, you know, oftentimes the competitors are looking at, you know, the top 2% of those top performance and saying, what is it that we could do to attract uh, someone like that? So what are some of the core elements that you see out there that some of the organizations that you've worked with, or maybe the ones that you haven't worked with, that you recognize that they need to implement in order to even get prepped, not even just for the high performance, but just to keep uh, most of their population engaged in their vision and their mission. Yeah. So I think one of the things you just ended off with there is important is getting really clear on who they are as an organization. What is their mission? What is their purpose? And that should come from the top and come all the way down, right? So cascade down so that everyone, no matter what your role is in the organization, they understand how they're um, linked to that bigger mission. I love how I think Starbucks does such a good job of doing that. Like everyone, doesn't matter if you're a barista in the store, if you're in corporate, um, it really came from the top and this understanding around like, this is who we want to be at Starbucks and this is what it means to work here. So everybody shared that common purpose, mission, goals. Um, and then the other piece is I hear so many organizations saying, we want to, we, we're innovative. We create environments where people can innovate and they can change and they can be creative and do all of this kind of stuff. Um, but they don't actually create the space for that to happen. In order for innovation to happen, you have to actually create an environment where people are allowed to, to try to experiment and to fail because you're going to try things that are not going to work and then that failure will lead to something else, which will lead to something else. So I think actually being a culture that creates that space um, for people to fail and to experiment and actually try things, um, it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to actually do it and create the environment. So where I see where cultures can really um, improve is getting really clear in who they are as a culture and then making sure like, what does that look like? What are those values? And then what are the behaviors associated with those values? And there's accountability when those values are not being honored and those behaviors are not being honored. Um, so that people are like, okay, so it's, who they say they are um, is authentic. It's not this disconnect where they say this is what we're all about, but then the behaviors and the actions do not line up. So how would they tie into that into uh, accountability, into strategy? Like, um, let's say, um, you know, I'm, I'm recognizing that uh, my middle managers, um, they seem to have more of a disconnect. And we know that middle management is kind of so important because they're the ones in the trenches taking care of so many things. And they're busy, right? Let's, I mean, to put it bluntly, with my portfolio in health and wellness, I was managing about 50 companies at the time that we worked together. Yeah. And I could see how overwhelmed that particular slice of the, of the um, companies were. They were constantly overwhelmed. Yeah. So what kind of things have you seen in reference to accountability? That's not scary. It doesn't go on the performance review per se, but it may be, it may be hooked to, um, you know, bottom line in some way, but what are the other ways that you've seen organizations do it um, that seems to have a buy-in from the individuals that work with them? Yeah. So a couple of things. So I think one thing is um, when you're even talking about performance, um, tying it into like if we're saying these are the values of our organization, these are the behaviors. So at the end of the year, when there's bonuses, bonuses shouldn't be just about um, bottom line in terms of you hit your numbers. The bonuses should also be associated, these values and behaviors that we're looking for in this role, You, this is how you demonstrated this and that's where, so you're actually literally being bonused out for that. That's very motivating. Um, so actually tie, tie, tie financial uh, bonuses towards that. The other thing is, um, and I like what you were mentioning there, it's true, like how often do you see these leaders who are burnt out, they're running from thing to thing, they have too much on their plate. 
So the other is um, the onus is um, we put so much onus on that manager reporting into the leader. How is that leader that that manager is reporting into? What are they doing? Like, how are they accountable? How are they supporting that person? Are they doing weekly check-ins, monthly check-ins, asking them what they need, how I can better support you? Where are you feeling overwhelmed? Like, is that conversation even happening? Because a lot of times it's not. <laughs> um, so like, so you're, you're holding your middle managers accountable without holding the leaders that those middle managers are reporting into. So I think there should be that support. And then they're asking them, like, what do you need from me? How can we make this uh, run even better? And sometimes there's things that just through having that conversation, efficiencies that can be created. Maybe you have somebody supporting that person, um, an admin person coming in and doing some of these tasks that's not the best use of their time. And now all of a sudden those efficiencies are being, are being traded off. So um, th there should be those conversations where the leaders are asking how they can be supporting them. Absolutely. And I think, you know, skill development is one thing. And oftentimes we go to the hard, you know, you need to be able to do this more efficiently, those types of things. But I think the on the soft end and, um, I, you know, I know you've been exposed to CEOs that are so connected and it's a, it's you, you want to work hard for them. I know with some of the organizations that I've worked with and others, you think, oh, boy, I'm just going to do what I got to do and I got to, you know, clear out the way. And it's that engagement, it, you know transparency they're real and i know gone are the days when i started in the industry where it was kind of like the ceo was somebody uh, you know and i often think of the owner of the company that we worked with um there was an example where um a couple of us were getting on the elevator and you wouldn't have worked there at the time and so he got on so i i got on and a couple of people actually got off the elevator because they were intimidated to be in the same elevator with him and i said well why i said this man's a visionary like i mean he's created such a big um, industry, you know, the pleasure is to spend three seconds in an elevator going down a couple of floors yeah. just by engaging him. Yeah. But again, that's a different context. Whereas now, you know, it's not unlike that any of us in organizations would stand up and, and say, help me understand what I'm missing. Um, but I think it's a different shift in culture. Would you agree? And of course, now with the millennials and what we know with them, yeah. they're, they're, hardcore checking out organizations and really seeing if their mission and vision is in line with what they want in their career. Yes, yes, it's absolutely like it is like you're saying more transparent and more open and um, people are more comfortable uh, being curious and asking questions and, and that, that same scenario in the elevator with the CEO will say, hey, so what's our goals for 2018 and 2019? Where are we going? What's the vision? They'll be comfortable asking those questions. And from the CEO's perspective, that's a beautiful thing. That shows an engaged employee. The engaged, like the engaged employee wants to know where we're going, we're curious, um, what's happening. I mean, an example of um, not doing that, um, I always like to talk about the CEOs who are doing it really well and the CEOs who are not. Um, I always think about, I'm forgetting his name right now, but the former CEO of Uber. Um, I remember him like getting really irate when customers would be making suggestions or asking questions like, this is your, these are your people who work for you. And it's not a matter of they're trying to fight you, but there was so much ego that got involved and lack of self-awareness that he was actually getting upset where anyone would have suggestions around how you might be able to be doing things a little bit differently. So um, it, it kind of makes me think of those leaders who are um, the leaders in the CEOs, and I'm sure you could attest to this, um, that do really well and engage their workforce. Um, they leave the ego at the door right? It's like when you start to bring the ego into it and like, oh, I don't, you, you can't tell me anything because I'm the CEO and you're there. No, they have lots to share with you. They have ideas. They're in the trenches. So when there's that openness to hear what they have to say, that's where, I mean, th there's so many great ideas that aren't even being heard. So I think the CEOs who are willing to have those conversations, I would still say there's some that are still old school, Mm -hmm. and aren't there yet and they need to go there because that's the path forward but the thing is it, to, to a lot of frontline employees perceptions is we're still doing well we've grown we've been the icon in the industry so what's the impetus for uh the ceos to make a shift and i mean in coaching some uh of the high level individuals it has to be a heightened person if it's a company that's been successful, maybe with the old kind of model, yeah. to want to really make that shift. Would you yeah. agree? 
Yeah. And the problem is you see these organizations that end up going out of business because they think they can just be continue being who they were. But as you see with technology and how things change so rapidly, mm -hmm. you need to be constantly evolving. Right. So I think that can get you in a lot of trouble when you think when you stay comfortable. Well, you know, um, I, I interviewed somebody once or was it a conversation and he was pretty senior. It was on a senior team and they hire a consulting firm, you know, like not a lot of HR consulting or whatever to come in because on their um, exit interviews, which I know is very telling, um, people would share these things that were, you know, less than professional or just a, more like a toxic kind of situation, or they couldn't keep people at that higher level uh, of executives. So they brought in this firm, the firm, you know, did all the, you know, the 360s or whatever other assessments that they would have done, yeah. came back all good. Yeah. But at the end of it, this particular uh, team member was telling me that everybody was truly afraid, not in a toxic way, but in a respect kind of way um, to say truly what, mm -hmm. they, what they felt. So they gave the external consultant the mm -hmm. answers they wanted um, them to hear because they were concerned that mm -hmm. that might in some way reflect um, what feedback the CEO got and in any way that the CEO would be able to figure out potentially which part of his team was kind of sharing things. Yeah. So at some point, one, one individual that came was attached in some way said, it's an interesting because your bottom, your metrics or your numbers are not lying to you. You look at retention and you, you've done, uh, you know, a lot with uh, talent management. So I'm interested in that. Your bottom line is telling you, you can't retain people. We know how expensive it is to lose someone. Yeah. So what are your numbers telling you? Because something here is not adding up. And then eventually what started to happen is a bit of a time. Some people got, more comfortable yes. because the CEO was more very um, what we call left brained or you know very Einstein -y, could was yes. a huge visionary but really couldn't tether to the ground and he would litanize potentially all the things that needed to get and he wasn't connecting yes yeah so he was inadvertently even though he was a brilliant man really not um, supporting people in a way and they felt like they were kind of thrown on the bus each time they had an interaction because they could never kind of keep up with what his expectations were. Yeah, absolutely. And then what you just said there too is the connection piece, right? You see this where people are brilliant and they have all of the technical skills, but the soft skills, which I, I even, I wish there was a different word and that's why I say emotional intelligence because yes. there's nothing soft about it. It's soft in that, I guess you can say the way they're coming out, but they're so critical to success because you can be so brilliant and be the visionary and do all of that kind of stuff. But if you can't communicate, you can't interact, you can't help un people understand that vision and also feel a, a create an environment where they feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, psychological safety is huge, right? Because if they, if they don't have that psychological safety, they're not going to tell the truth. And I find a big piece of creating the psychological safety with leaders. And I work with a lot of leaders in this area is vulnerability which is showing up and, and even admitting, like even if he as a leader said, um, you know, where he does something and said, hey, I really failed there. Like I didn't, I didn't handle that the way I could have handled it, right? The more they share parts of themselves and share how they're human and they make mistakes just like everybody else, then now there's this level of this psychological safety. There's some trust. Now people can start communicating and sharing, well, you know, one thing, thing I noticed was X, Y, Z, and then now they're communicating how they were feeling. But um, vulnerability is, it's a big one. It's a hard, it's, it's, it feels uncomfortable. Um, yes. And I think a lot of leaders, um, they start to notice a great deal of success when they build that skill, which is very learnable. Like it's not something you either have or you don't have. We all have it. It's just tapping into it. Right, because I mean, in MBA school, <laughs> I don't know how much time they would be spending talking about vulnerability and connection and um, EI and things of that nature. Right, they're 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 uh, marketing and R and D and all that other stuff, which is very very necessary for yeah. the world of business. Yeah. But maybe on the other end, what we're finding is like you're using the you know the Starbucks of the world and stuff like that. Um, where people are loving on these companies, but now your customer um, is on the web. 
So no longer are you just meeting in a boardroom like we used to years ago to talk about you know how what the quarter is going to look like and, and the growth perspectives, but you have people kind of coming from any. Your customers can make comments on your product from anywhere uh, or your service. What what a big pressure! And and if you're if you're disconnected from that, the impact of that is is huge. Yes. So, yes. And if you have happier employees, you have happier customers. It always, and there can be such an emphasis on happier customers, but not enough emphasis, emphasis on happier employees. So tell me when, uh, with your customers, how do they come to you? And if people, like how you work with individuals, because like, I know you work with individuals, but you also work with corporations. So share with us kind of the how you um, intervene with individuals. And if people listening were wanting to understand your model, if you could share a bit about that so they, they can get an understanding, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Roxanne. Thanks for asking. Um, so when I work with either individuals or leaders and organizations, it's very similar in that um, my uh, shortest engagement is at least six months. And most often that six months leads to another six months, so six months to a year. Um, because we're really looking for meaningful change here, right? So it's not the band-aids. It's not just doing these two or three sessions and we're done. It's really helping people go deeper and getting to know themselves better and make lots of different shifts. Um, so in terms of individuals and, and how they find me, I mean, a lot of my clients have found me through referrals, speaking engagements, me working with organizations and building relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but I love, I, I think the best way with coaching, it's so, it's really, really about fit, right? There has to be this, um, this feeling of connection and safety, like we we're talking about safety, where that person really feels like that's a person that I can um, I can trust and be vulnerable with and go everywhere I need to go um, and not hold yourself back, right? So from my perspective, anytime somebody's looking to consider coaching, I love to just have a conversation, right? Um, you know, talk for an hour, talk 45 minutes in, in, or an hour. But what I do when the, that conversation is actually do some coaching so that person can really feel and experience what coaching's like. I personally, as someone who has experienced coaching, and obviously I'm so passionate about it, I think every single person <laughs> could benefit from coaching because it's just like you yourself, where you think you can go, and then having somebody who's there mirroring back to you and, and helping you see blind spots and, and limiting beliefs, places where you're holding yourself back, mm -hmm. uh, can just help you like push yourself to go to places that you never even thought possible, you never even anticipated. Um, so that's what I really think the, the role of the coach is. And I specifically love, I love working with leaders because they're impacting a lot of people. I also love working with people who are ready to sometimes make shifts. So in terms of meaningful work, maybe they're doing something and they're realizing like, this is not the work that I'm meant to be doing in the world. They want to make a bigger impact. And sometimes it's getting through the fears and limiting beliefs that are holding themselves back from really going out there in a bigger way. So I love just having conversations and giving people an opportunity to experience coaching and what it's, what it's like. So you're kind of like the vein that allows them to really be. Um, and oftentimes, you know, when I, I coach or, or see my clients also, it's really feeding back to them and challenging them to, to really yeah. see it from a different, like, why, why can't you do that? Like yeah. you have this vision, you have these, you have heard you say this, this, or this, and they go, Ooh, wow. Yes, I get. I guess I must because I, you know, I just basically uh, regurgitated some of the things that you shared uh, with me, kind of thing. So it's yeah. you're right, and and we all need that, right? Because with our unconscious brain, like like, and it's going all the time. You, you know, there's a lot of white noise, isn't there? When yeah. in our brains, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we know we have a love or a passion, but those those uh pushback or those thoughts that are sometimes, you know, what is it? 60,000 thoughts in a day. And yes. you know, how much, how many of those really um, work against us? Be just because, right. We just kind of let it create a space for itself and it becomes bigger or we kind of push back the other way to kind of challenge ourselves to think a bit more subjectively to get out of our frame of reference and see it's for what it is versus what I think it is, how, how I interpret it. So that the value of a coach there is, is very, very key. Yeah. So tell us a bit about some of the speaking that you do and um, what kind of topics do you uh, focus on? Is it talent management? Is it authenticity with leaders? What, what, where, where do you um, 
the focus of your speaking engagements? Where do they focus? Yeah, so I definitely focus on emotional intelligence. So um, specifically with leaders, I love um, helping them learn around self-awareness and emotional intelligence and how it's such a critical skill um, and their ability to be a really good leader. Um, specifically that same content from an individual perspective as well. Um, I love doing work around mindfulness. I, I, I work with a lot of clients who are highly successful, but they are also highly burnt out. Right? They're working 90 hour work weeks, running, 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 racing, 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 and helping them just take a step back. Um, a lot of my clients end up getting into doing meditation and, um, but not even just meditation, mindfulness, um, hour to hour and getting back to their breath and checking in with themselves and, and also being fully present, right? We can be just like, like you were saying, 46.9% of the time we're thinking about something other than what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. So instead of like being there doing a task, you're thinking about the past, what's happening a week from now. So that makes us feel really frazzled and disconnected from our work. So I love helping organizations and then the individual to really get connected to mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the individual helping them like we were talking about with the mindset piece, right? That our thoughts are so powerful and our thoughts can really empower us or, or our thoughts can really hold us back and keep us from living a really rich, fulfilling, successful life. Um, but I find it's this kind of um, the whole happiness and success uh, conundrum it the happier you are the more successful you actually become as opposed to the more successful you are the happier you are right so it's <laughs> getting them connected to that yes and being intentional mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah not just haphazard kind of oh I'm just gonna see you know what happens today kind of thing so with yeah. mindfulness in the workplace because obviously yeah. you know uh, and one-to-one -one coaching and things like that it's it's kind of a given a lot we recognize in order to really stay focused, we need to stay, yeah. you know, we need to declutter, I often say, right? Yeah. It's kind of like yeah. we, can't, uh, we can't go too long without putting out the garbage because eventually things are going to pile up. It's the same thing with our brain. Yeah. So in, in companies and with uh, also even maybe senior executives, how open are they to the concept? I mean, you know, with some of the industries that we dealt with, you know, uh, the norm, like in legal, the norm on a, uh, you know, a, partnership is like sometimes 80 90 hours a week you know um female lawyers they can't retain past you know 32 once they've had their first child there's certain industries that have certain stressors that they're not going away yeah. um, but people that decide to stay in those how open are they to things like uh mindfulness even though the craziness of the hours may not lessen as much yeah I definitely think the appetite is there. I think that, and even like looking at those ones like legal firms, and I have even seen some legal firms that are making strides and changing the culture. I do find it starts from the top and that's sometimes because they're females that are starting the law firms and they're asking, they're demanding for it. This, they're creating it. So they get to decide what that looks like. Um, but I think that even with the working, if it's, you know, you're still gonna work the 80 or 90 hours, you can still work the 80 or 90 hours in a more productive way. And sometimes it's even about helping them understand some of those uh, skills that are so counterintuitive, which is like give yourself 20 minutes for lunch and leave your desk and let yourself clear your mind because then you come back and you're so much more refreshed, right? Right. So even those, those little tools that they can be using throughout the day or allowing themselves like in the evenings to be able to go to yoga or a meditation class or something to be able to, like you're saying, I like that language around the garbage and decluttering and getting that all out. So that even when they are there, they're actually enjoying those 80 or 90 hours as opposed to kind of being in it and like racing and not taking care of their health, not paying attention to what they're eating, not taking care of their minds. So at least if they could be putting some of those things into practice, then it feels the way they're experiencing work starts to feel different. Absolutely. And I would think to, you know, with some organizations, again, if we're talking about talent retention, that's got to be big, right? Like if you're on a senior executive team in a high powered industry, that's, you know, in growth mode, we know how that goes. We've all been there. Yeah. Uh, it's like, okay, we'll, 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 we'll relax when we're done, which was the concept from years ago that we would see in a lot of industry. And we're, now we're recognizing, well, there won't be much left of anybody at that point. So it's kind of doing the small incremental things. And 
you know, um, a lot of times in my coaching or my practice, I'll talk about little minutes, what you can do in a couple mm-hmm. minutes here or there. And people go, well, mm-hmm. you know, people think that they have to have this grandiose concept of what mindful really mindfulness really is. And I, and they go, and then I'll teach them one or two things and they go, wow, mm-hmm. I can't yeah. believe that really works. Yeah. I, say, I often, it sounds like that's the same kind of thing that you do, which is cumulative effects, right? It's the same thing as burnout, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You're going, you're going the opposite way. If you could do yeah. periodic yeah. things, like you said, yeah. something as if I can't leave my office to turn off every potential electronic around me right or even take off the light in my office and just close my eyes um and listen to my breath is something that you could do kind of thing but uh, again some of those things were promoted in the corporate sector for a long time yes yeah exactly and and also there's an onus on the organization to create some of those boundaries as well right so if you're saying people don't need to be aren't expected to be answering emails or messages outside of work hours then your leaders better not be sending emails at nine o'clock at night or 5 a.m. in the morning, right? So it's setting those boundaries as well because it's one thing to say you're not expected to respond to the email, but the email is still being sent and then that individual feels an onus on them. So the organization also has, and I think it's, there's this kind of this um, perception sometimes it's like either the organization or it's the individual. I think it's really about both of them working in tandem. The organization should be setting some boundaries and having some accountability and responsibility. The individual should also be setting boundaries, accountability, responsibility for themselves, right? Because I'm not for the victim mentality either, right? Like if you're in a situation and you don't like it, you also have the opportunity to change and go somewhere else too, right? So it's making sure both 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 um, groups are taking responsibility. Absolutely, and you know, you sometimes the 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 resources are there on employees so I just don't have time right. but they're struggling right then it's like okay well why don't if that's a benefit that you've gotten um, and you can use it anywhere and we know now the modalities for some of those resources are quite accessible everything is we're all on our, our remote our, our mobile devices there's lots of things that you can do right so I think you're yeah. absolutely because w- what you don't want is that if you're not taking responsibility and the organization is offering it to you and you're not using that benefit, then at some point you have to weigh it out and say, okay, either I need to change my sandbox yeah. <laughs> or I have to change something within my sandbox so I yeah. can you know, take better care of myself. Now, do you find that um, with some of the HR policy, um, are you seeing a lot of shifts in HR policy to, to in, implement things like mindfulness or um, work-life balance strategies, you know, from an HR perspective, what kind of things have you seen probably um, in the industry, maybe since I've kind of been out for a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the good news is I'm definitely seeing it evolving and organizations are getting it and there's way, way, way more companies that are getting curious about it, asking about it, having it available. They're even having um, some organizations will do like the eight week mindfulness training and have someone come into the organization and doing it. Um, right. so they're definitely they are definitely evolving um, like anything different organizations are at different stages so I think some um, their their cultures are a little bit behind and they haven't gotten there um, but definitely in the last um, I've noticed in the last five years for sure way more of an appetite conversations understanding um, excitement around mindfulness mm-hmm. um, and not only just about like the the bottom line for the organization, how it's going to impact them, but uh, a sincere caring about the employee and not wanting the employee to be burnt out. Like I, d- I definitely see there's a lot of good companies out there. Um, there's definitely room for growth um, for more to, to be doing this. And um, it was funny when you start to bring up HR and rules and compliance, because um, that's where I think HR also has an opportunity to not be just about <laughs> rules, compliance, and that kind of stuff. Like from a strategic standpoint, I think that they really have an opportunity and a lot more organizations are you know, understanding that HR is just as important as whoever is running that organization and them working together. But they also have to, HR has to make sure that they are being strategic and looking at the bigger picture around the organization. Right, because I know that was also an issue when we were, I worked in uh, corporate well, wellness was HR being worthy to have a, a voice at the uh, executive table. 
right? Yeah. So yes, you have compliance here. There's certain things, but yes. what we focused on has really been, like you said, the, uh, the EQ of the organization yeah. and you know the value of recognizing that if you take care of your people really, really well, ultimately your bottom line, like your short term and your long term claims, which is what we, the world we lived in, um, mm -hmm. to create a business case. And unfortunately, with things which has grown exponentially, you know, since we've been in, in that kind of uh, setting is that things like anxiety and depression is on the rise. Like, mm -hmm. so it's, it, don't tell me that it's all of a sudden, all, everybody biologically that has ever had an issue with anxiety and depression, that's increased. We know that most, a lot of it is situational. It's yeah. not taking the, the, the small steps to be able to, you know, years ago when our parents worked, they came home, you know, you never saw your, you know, I never did with my dad, even though he was an executive, the phone was never on his hip. You know, the, 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 the iPad was not, you know, on the counter at the kitchen table, those types of things. So it's really about adjusting that perspective about how we're going to, I want to say protect our, our mental capacity. And we, we think of mental illness, but really is it, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum and we're, we're taxing. Um, our brain so much that it's almost like, how do we do those respite exercises? We all have to sleep, <laughs> but how do we, how do we kind of shut off our brain to be able to go to work again the next day and the next day and the next day? Well, and Roxanne, what you're saying is so important because just like you were describing with your dad and coming home, that's not only impacting that, that executive, that's impacting their family, like the next generation. So what's that like for those kids? You know, as, as a child, you would have had, you know, your dad shut off work, came home, and now he's fully connected to you. Well, so now you have these kids where the parents, there's a disconnect around their relationship and their connection. Absolutely. So that's impacting the next generation and how they're going to show up. So, you know, that's what I love around when you're coaching leaders all of the self-awareness and all these ways that they grow, it doesn't just impact them as a leader, it impacts them as a husband, it impacts them as a dad, like now they're fully present in their life. Um, and the other thing it made me think of as you were saying that around, you know, the organization's appetite for mindfulness, that's getting really good, but where I still see there's a disconnect is organizations investing in leaders. Like they're still not, when I go to talks and ask conversations around who has executive coaching available for your leaders, who's doing focus long-term leadership development programs for your leaders, there's not enough hands that go up in the room. Right, right. So they recognize there's a need, but their investment isn't there yet, uh, potentially for them to recognize. And, and maybe, you know, I don't know how that works, but you, when we look at the metrics for short term and long term, I would wonder what percentage is in their senior leadership team. Because unfortunately, high performers, yeah. they're like the bug that hits the windscreen, just they, they fall quite quickly, but they can take a lot before they fall. Would you agree with that? Because they're high functioners, they some are sometimes, unfortunately, because of their aptitude and act, acumen, they can extend and extend and other parts of their life may be falling apart, but they're able to compartmentalize, do a job very well. And, um, you know, and they, you may not see them bearing out as much as maybe say the average frontline person, you know, in leaves or, or maybe incidental absences, those types of things too. Right. And they struggle with asking for help because they're just, they want to do it all by themselves and they can figure it out. And so, I mean, I definitely see um, many organizations who are investing in executive coaching, but I think that there's, um, there definitely could be more and it has such a, an impact on, it, it does have a huge, huge impact on the bottom line because that leader is impacting, especially when you're at the executive level, because that leader is leading other leaders who are leading other leaders. Uh, and so, but I even think mid leaders and up, you've got these emerging leaders who were high performers. Now all of a sudden they're leaders, everything shifts, like what they were doing as an individual contributor and what they're doing as a leader. A lot of people don't know um, what, what that looked like until they get into it. And all of a sudden they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm leading, I'm dealing with people stuff all day long. Right. It's not I'm right, just doing right. So I'm going from management, which is more, you know, actual skills to manage the day to day to go to leadership where now you're taking an, an aerial view and your role is ready to lead people. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you're right. They get pulled up the ranks because they're very good and they've achieved a lot. And now they're in charge of people and they have, you know, they're, they're maybe not so bad, but they, they need that skill to be able to, um, you know, support people to, to be able to still manage, but yeah. to also have people follow them in a way. And they're, they're, they're spare, 
that of, of um, the people that their impact get bigger and bigger every level that you go up. Yeah. You know, so that's really, really important. So, um, so for anyone listening, so this is amazing. I, you know, it sounds like I should call you. Because <laughs> Um, so where can people reach you? Because I'm, you know, I know you had said that there's uh they have the capacity to do some sort of exploratory or a discovery session with, with you. So tell people where they can reach you and uh, organizations uh, that may want to consult with you or have you speak at their organizations. Yeah. Thanks for Roxanne. So my website's pretty easy. So it's Kristen Harcourt. So kristenharcourt.com. You can get a little bit more information on some of my background and would love to, I'm always open to a conversation. No pressure. We just see where it goes, right? It's just starting off with the conversations, taking a step. Awesome. And I, you know, I've gained so much today just from listening and recognizing what parallels we have, even though our backgrounds kind of uh, came from different spots, you know, um, yourself in HR and, and business development and mine in as a psychotherapist in account management, um, you know, and then, you know, so it's, it's kind of those worlds collided when we were at, uh, well, what's now Morner Chappelle together. So for everyone listening, um, if anything, I've, I've listened to uh, Kristen today, the importance of being real and which is my, you know, uh, concept about being authentic and the more, uh, connected who you are to yourself and um, recognize that we all have things that we continually need to work on, um, but to be gentle and kind to yourself um, day to day, you know, something very, very small um, impacts you. And then it, I, I often say it impacts the people around you, which I call the concentric circles uh, around you. So the, the better and more connected you are to yourself, just imagine the gift that you're giving to the others around you. So again, uh, thanks again, Kristen, for uh, uh, sharing your time with us. And uh, we'll talk to you soon if you're wanting anything more uh, with myself. Uh, you can uh, go to my website at roxanderhodge.com um, forward slash blueprint where you'd have uh, access to a free course. Take care and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.